Hi, Daisy and Eli. How are you? Hi. Good. We're good. Good. It's good to see you. I am excited to talk to you about these big existential questions about life and morality. Um, and for those of you who are watching at home, um, do want to let you know that this is largely going to be a conversation between me and Daisy and Eli. Um, so, but you should feel free to follow along, have conversations at home with your families. Um, alongside us. And if at any point it feels helpful, you can pause the video so that you can do that conversation on the side um, as well. All right. So um, just to get started, Daisy and Eli, I mean, we, I've heard a lot about you, but we also don't know each other super well. So I just wanted to make sure to, you know, carve out some space um, in case there's anything you want to share with me about you. Is there something I should know about, you know, about you, how you like to learn, any hobbies um, or anything before we get started? Well, I'm one thing is I'm really interested in this topic. Cool. Ah, I love hearing it. Uh, I thought the article is very interesting. Nice. I read it with yeah. my mom. Why not? <laughs> That's a great start. Um, is there anything that you're curious to know about me? Because I'm a, basically a stranger to you at this point. What do you think about the article? Oh, I think it's very interesting. And if you, if it wasn't clear, I mean, the article was written in 2006, right? So I've been thinking about it ever since. And I think that there are a lot of things in there that are still just really relevant today, which is why, um, why I picked it for us. Um, and then another just fun question that I like to do just to check in with um, my team at work sometimes is, um, what's your favorite way to eat potatoes? Just, my mom makes baked potatoes. Uh, sometimes she like slices them up, puts them in a toaster oven with a little olive oil and salt, and that's my favorite way. Mm. Yeah, same. <laughs> Especially when they get really bubbly. Oh my gosh, that sounds delicious. I'm sure if I had them, they would be my new favorites. I think I'm still <laughs> gonna uh, stick to fries though. Um, with a <laughs> all salt, you know, cause I'm a little fancy, but. Um, um, now that we know everything there is to know about each other, uh, do you want to dive in <laughs> to our conversation? Um, I want to share a little bit of a plan of how we're going to walk through this today so you kind of know where we're going and it doesn't feel totally aimless. I'm going to kick off with some just questions um, about how you think about this stuff separate from the article because I want you to see that you actually know and have opinions that are really relevant already. Um, then we'll jump into the article and take on just kind of some big key ideas that the author references. Um, and I'll ask you some questions about that, what you think, if you agree, disagree with that stuff. Um, we'll pause a little bit for any questions that you might have. Um, but then I want to move into kind of part two, which is to take on some scenarios. One is kind of a random scenario, and the other one I want to connect back to some of the current events that you have been talking about with your uncle, and you can kind of pick which one uh, we do with that. And the goal here is to land with a closing in which you, Daisy, and Eli share with all of us what your rules to live by would be. Are you, are you up for that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So if we're just kicking off, like what comes to mind when you hear the word um, morals or morality? Like what do you think of when that wor word comes up or ethics? Like what's right? It's just what's right, what's wrong? Well, Daisy? I think of my uncle because my uncle works with ethics teaches ethics. Oh, really? Oh my gosh, oh, why is that? Me? No, sorry, no. She's, she's wrong. Oh. oh, wait, Joseph? Yeah, yeah. but he's a he's, he's an economics, economics professor, which by the way, is also potentially relevant for some of the things in this, in this article. You can follow up with him on that. Um, so what's right? So who, who gets to decide what's right or what's good? You, really. Well, me? Uh, well, what? like, <laughs> well, in our perspective, we think opinions and we think this is right. Like, I think it's right to like uh, potatoes and, <laughs> of course, Eli might not think it's right to like potatoes, but in my perspective, it's right to like potatoes. And what if 
your parents say you have to like potatoes. Do they get a say in that? No. They don't, maybe not on potatoes, but they might get a say in some cases on what, what is right or what is yeah. good in your, in your home, right? Um, and then the government also legislates, right? And comes up with laws. And some of those reflect the values of our society, yeah. or what, uh, what they believe is, is right or good most of the time. So um, how do you both decide what actions you're going to take day to day? Like whether you think it's right or good, what influences you when you're making a tough choice? Uh, I don't know, Daisy. Uh, I think, is that a bug? Oh, I've come over mine. Um, I think uh, what influences me is usually something similar to that topic. Like am I, if I'm thinking, do I want to buy apples? I might think, did I like the last time I bought apples? Did I enjoy the experience? Or were the apples unripe and I, and they might be ripe or stuff like that. Got it. Now, does your action change if it impacts somebody else? Like if say Eli really loved apples and there was the, like only one apple left, um, would your action change based on your knowledge that Eli? I might have, yeah, shared the apple with him. Yeah. Now what if- Depending it, on the day, definitely. Depending on the day. <laughs> If he hasn't annoyed you or something like yeah. that, <laughs> should those should those circumstances matter? Uh, yeah. I say actually no. It's just petty arguments. But <laughs> I don't know why I have petty arguments, but just do. <laughs> and would it matter, or would your opinion change if um, the other person that it impacted was a stranger? No. Probably not. It I'm mostly like, it depends actually, yeah, maybe. It might um, depend. Like if they, if I just know of someone who's walking, who's like, uh, he's going oh to the supermarket God, today, who I know, uh, who uh, like, a, some random TV star who obviously loves apples or something <laughs> like that. And we know they're go and like, somehow you know they're going to the supermarket. No, they can get their own apples. Um, but if it's like someone asked me, oh, I, I really uh, haven't had apples in a very long time. And I'm like, oh, I have apples all the time here. You can have, I'd be like, you can have the apple. So sometimes the circumstances matter and whether somebody can uh, get, get something themselves influences your decision. Yeah. Creepy. Maybe. Like someone thinking of that is creepy. Like I just... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, like if someone from Australia like really way. likes apples and there's no apples uh, left in Australia and they're still in Australia, oh my gosh, there's one apple left. No, I'm not going to leave it for some random person in Australia who ran out of apples and likes apples because I don't even know them. And how are they, how am I going to get it to them? How do we get that? Yeah. Got it. Well, honestly, you're raising so many good questions and issues, many of which you might recognize came up in the article. Like, does it matter if you know or don't know the person? Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Another situation where you might have to kind of um, observe some moral code might be at school, right? Do you ever in your classrooms um, decide on class agreements or anything like that? Or class norms or class rules? Yeah, usually at the start of the year, every year, we have class rules, and they're usually just like, keep your hands to yourself, don't talk when somebody else is talking, raise your hands, be kind, be respectful. Or even like, do you want the red folder to be for drawing or reading? Stuff you like that. You get to make choices like that too. That's nice. So sometimes you have in yeah. on those. Like last year, we have, uh, in my class, we had a class meeting, and uh -huh. you literally could, if, um, you could bring up any topic, topic you'd be like I want this mm -hmm. and as long as it didn't single somebody out you would everybody would take a vote on it they would have a committee and uh, and the committee would decide on the rules you'd vote on it again and like literally we had like 
we had the possibility of six extra parties. I voted yes for like every single party. <laughs> Who wouldn't that? vote yes for a party? I mean, you know. Um, so what I love that you're bringing up are, is that um, in the context of um, a shared community, like your classroom, there are times where you kind of all agree on something for the benefit of your community. And that's kind of an idea that a lot of philosophers have talked about called the social contract. Even some of the philosophers described in the article have theories about this. And we won't go super deep on any of it. But the idea is basically that at some point, um, people in a shared community have to agree, whether explicitly, like by choosing themselves, or implicitly by staying as part of the community, on certain roles that everyone should abide rules that everyone should abide by so everyone benefits and sometimes that means that you give up a little bit of your freedom like you can't just hit someone because you feel like it right that happens to yourself because there's a shit it will put an impression on you like oh there's a kid that hit somebody yeah well you definitely do oh my gosh so what's so good about that is that reminds me of your conversation with dr costanzo about social psychology and I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because there are ways in which some of this kind of connects to that too. Um, you know, we kind of know certain things are wrong, right? Certain things are, are good. Um, but you can see that it's probably easier to create a social contract of sorts in a smaller community, right? Like in your family or in a classroom. And it starts to become a little bit harder of what that looks like when you are talking about states and countries um, or even globally right at some point it's not just a conversation between individuals it's a conversation between governments and governments have to agree on certain rules or guidelines to abide by and i heard you talk about some of those kinds of agreements in the climate change conversation um, with your uncle too that governments had some agreements there but just because governments have agreements doesn't really let us off the hook for thinking about like, what do we do as individuals, right? So that's kind of where we're going in this conversation. So let's actually turn to the article now. Um, what should a billionaire give and what should you? Because the author raises all of these things in the context of a particular situation related to, uh, or in, in relation to global poverty. Um, so let's not bury like what's the headline here what's the answer does the author give us an answer on that question they do give us numbers like if um oh that is a bug um uh billionaires donate like 25 percent of their money they'll still get like a million or three million i wonder what oh like if billionaires donate like yeah it's a whole page i know it's too much i know i gave it to you. <laughs> but the idea there was the author is saying billionaires can give a lot of money and still have a lot left over right so what do you think eli before i start talking i just I'm great, Daisy, mostly. <laughs> so let's break down how how the author makes his argument. And I know I really just asked you to focus on the beginning and the end because that's kind of the, the main stuff, but we'll go over the in-between a little bit. Um, so one of the things that comes up at the beginning of the article is uh, Bill Gates and Bill Gates having this realization um, about global poverty. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. And what was what was he realizing? He realized that millions of kids were dying every year from like avoidable causes and that mm -hmm. he could save a lot of them. Yes. Exactly. Like, no idea I had no idea this was happening. Exactly. More than I ever told. Him. And, and basically, he's saying, you know, we start with this idea that all human lives have equal value, but it sort of seems like we're not acting like that's true. 
Do you agree with the idea that all lives have equal value? Yeah. Yeah. Are there places where you see positive evidence that we're acting in alignment with that idea? Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like people yeah. do good, yeah? Do you see times where, like Bill Gates, that sometimes it doesn't seem like we're acting like that? Maybe through even bringing up some of the ideas that you talked about um, in your other current events classes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what's, a, what's an example where maybe there's a tension in how we're acting and this um, idea? Well, Bill Gates did donate a lot of money compared to what he was donating before. I guess that's an example. Can you think of any other good from articles? Or of doing good. Um, Our bet. Well, a lot of billionaires are doing good and donating. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Not do enough. You, what's that? Not as much as anybody would like because it's don't because if all the, if every single person pulled like ten dollars, that's yeah. seventy yeah. billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That could save a lot of lives. Save More than lot. seventy. Do you think you had a you had a, a really meaty conversation about immigration? Do you think that we are acting in alignment with belief that all lives have equal value when we're looking at people who are immigrating to the United States? Where are we showing that we do? Where are we showing that maybe we don't? Well, we we're we're showing that we do that there's like actually a chance that you can get in and you'll probably get in no you probably <laughs> won't get in but at, we're not because a lot of people are sent back and then they can die just because but like a game thinks they have money but they don't and they can't pay the game that's right like, oh because of the corruption happening in certain places yeah that's a great example so that also raises questions of okay wait is that okay you know, is it okay that we let people go? Or what what kinds of things do we need to think about in that trade-off? What's the moral decision? Have you heard of a movement called Black Lives Matter? Yeah. Yes. What do you what do you think that's about? Well, well I uh there was policemen who were sh uh shooting black people and for pretty much no reason at all on no real claims and they weren't the people weren't being violent so a movement was started i'm pretty sure that it i don't know a lot about it but i know like the basics yeah no that's that's you know right on in a lot of ways now some people say or argue that when they hear the expression black lives matter they want to say all lives matter Right, and that somehow saying Black Lives Matter is in conflict with the idea that all lives matter. What do you think about that? Well, I agree with both of those things: Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. all lives matter. Yeah, and I believe that if uh, people are acting like uh, Black Lives don't matter, you should say that Black Lives do matter, and make sure people know that all lives do matter. You don't have to say all lives do matter because then people could be like, "Well, they're not." A people who are really mean can be like, well, they're not alive for something like that. And you have to, when people aren't treating someone as having a life that's worth just as much as theirs, you have to raise the point that they're worth just as much as you. Um, and yeah, the reason why they made it Black Lives Matter instead of All Lives Matter is because a lot of people thought that, uh, some lives matter more than black lives. So saying black lives matter is not saying other lives don't matter. It's just saying this life, these people's lives matter too. Absolutely. You said that so beautifully. Um, thank you for that. And you may have heard, and what's something that's just heavy on my heart, um, well, always, um, but especially this week, is a story of a young man who was jogging 
in Georgia a couple months ago, uh, a black man, a young black man, um, was killed by two white men uh, while he was jogging. And what's clear from a video that was released is he wouldn't have been killed if he wasn't black. Now, those two men were not arrested um, for two months. You know, they were just arrested last night once the public sort of came into knowledge of this video. And today would have been that young man, Ahmad Arbery's 26th birthday. And um, to kind of recognize that not everybody can jog freely and safely in this world, uh, people are uh, choosing to run 2.23 miles to mark the occasion when he was killed um, and to raise awareness for the fact that there is still a lot of injustice in the world and a devaluing of Black lives. And I plan to do this um, after we get off the phone, probably walk because I'm you know, in quarantine shape. But um, you know, a question for me is, you know, that's good and all, but is that enough? If there's that real injustice in the world, what really should I be doing um, to make sure it changes? Uh, and again, that's the conversation that we're going to keep coming back to through this article. So thanks for uh, going with me on, on, that, on that detour. Um, do you think that as a society, we value poor and rich lives equally? I think we should, but not a lot of people do. And why do you think that? Because sometimes you get rich because you got lucky. Uh -huh. You bought a lottery ticket. Oh my gosh, I got a lottery ticket. Yay, my <laughs> life is more than everybody. No, it's not. <laughs> sometimes like you did it through hard work. Everybody else is working hard. They just might not have the same opportunities. Yeah. Because let's say they got sick on during their work and they keep getting sick or they just can't go to work. They don't have the same opportunities as you. So how could they be as, become as rich as you? You're still worth the same amount. It's really just getting lucky. Like smart, like working hard has something to do with it, but not enough to like matter at all. Right, right. Some people are just not even starting in the same place. Yeah. Um, I think that um, if people thought that people who were poor and people who were rich lives would matter, then everyone in the world would have pretty much the same amount of money, because if they did think it would matter, then they'd probably donate something to the cause. I, and if everyone did, it would probably be fixed. I think that's super interesting to think about. Um, you might see, I don't know if you all uh, followed any of the Democratic debates, and sure, there are going to be more as we get between you know, our nom Democratic nominee and uh, President Trump. Uh, in the coming months, but you'll see in those debates, if you didn't already, a real kind of debate about what our responsibility is and how we should, as government or in policy, treat those who are most vulnerable. You know, how should policies change the way that um, people live, potentially for the better, and people have different uh, ideas about that. So in some ways, moral philosophy, this idea is really about what kind of government do you think is necessary and what policies do you think are necessary? So let's take a couple moral philosophers that the author references and see if we agree with their ideas. So one of them was uh, Thomas Hobbes. Do you remember him or what they said about him? Not really, no. No pressure. It was like one line. But I love it because I remember learning about him. Oh, sorry, Daisy, did you want to say something? I remember there were two ideas. And uh -huh. one of them, I'm not sure which is which, but one of them was to donate um, because it made you feel good. And the mm -hmm. other one was to donate because it was the right thing to do. Yeah, okay. So this is, I'm going to pause on Thomas Hobbes and we're going to jump to Kant, Immanuel Kant, because that's who you're bringing up. So, yeah, what do you think about that? Do you think it matters um, what the motivation for doing something is? And what did Kant believe? I think it's a bit of like motivation. Like if you feel good about doing something, you should do it. But if you feel morally obligated to do something and you don't feel good doing it, if you feel morally ob obligated to do it and you're like uncomfortable not doing it, but don't want to do it, you should probably do it. Morally, <laughs> it really depends. Right? 
You said it right. Yeah. No, that's great. You could do it for both reasons. Are both are both versions moral? Are both versions good? I guess, but just doing it because it feels good isn't that moral. It's like kind of moral, but not really. But so that that's you agree with her there. Good, so you should follow it. Yeah. But what so some people believe that the motivations matter and some philosophers believe, and people like me or you know might believe that uh the consequences matter more the reason why you do something isn't as big of a deal as what the actual outcome is so if say bill gates or any of these billionaires are doing it to you know puff up their reputation and make themselves look good so what you know, at the end of the day, trying to work on global poverty. What do you think of that, Daisy? Um, I really think that the fact that people are donating is good in general. Mm -hmm. I usually do it because I feel like it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. not because it makes me feel good. I mean, after I do it, sure, it makes me feel a little better, but I don't do it because it makes me feel better. Got it. Yeah. Now, so I'm going to bring Thomas Hobbes back up again. And he, well, I remember when I learned about him, I thought he was a total cranky pants. I was like, geez, buddy, you know, people aren't all that bad. But his idea, which the author references really quickly, is that people only act in their self-interest. Do you, do you believe that? Possibly, yes. Like, some some actions may not be for yourself but mm -hmm. most actions you can trace them back like saving like oh i saved ina's life it could probably it, it could just be the reason that i wanted to save ina's life just as much as it could be i didn't want to have to experience her dying but of course it's because i want to save your life of course yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, so that, it's interesting that you say that because that's where the author is kind of calling Hobbes's bluff. He's saying, look, you, uh, you know, Hobbes apparently, you know, did something nice for someone. There was a story and uh, Hobbes says it's consistent because he was doing it because he felt better, you know. And essentially the author is saying, yeah, but you're kind of robbing this idea that we're selfish from all its like power, right? Um, just a little aside, Hobbes takes that idea to a total extreme, which is like, if we were all without government and just kind of operating, you know, without, you know, rules, the natural state would be like Lord of the Flies. It would be total chaos. <laughs> Nothing would be going well. Everyone would be fighting for things, you know, and that's why he has a very extreme view of what government should be, which is like government has to kind of take over everything. We have to give up all our rights and only the government can decide which I think is a little nuts, but you know, for the sake of philosophical discussion. And like, who's gonna be the government? How do you yeah. know you? Yeah, right. <laughs> if the government's corrupt. Yeah. Just give everything to them? I mean, exactly. Uh, there should be a better government, or there should be no government, or there should be just laws that everybody <laughs> follows, but everybody and everybody enforces those laws with lots of different views like laws government everybody votes on whatever they want there's a government and everybody votes on whatever they want which is they're both pretty much democracy but and then there could also be there's laws and everybody enforces the laws so everybody else is going to punish you if you break those laws or lots of stuff yeah most of, most of them aren't ever used but there's they might have been used to have been used or who knows yeah these are, i mean these are big questions right honestly you can kind of make yourself a little nutty thinking about it so i apologize if that happens to you after our conversation um why don't actually one more question one more philosopher who's um you know whose ideas are in this article peter singer what does peter singer believe you know who that is no I don't remember him being mentioned in the article. Yeah, so it's totally a trick question. Peter Singer is the author of the article. He himself is a, he is an Australian philosopher. Um, and basically the whole 
article is what he believes. And I think he took a very measured approach because in other articles, he takes a very hard line on this idea of what you need to give. Um, let's jump a little bit to, um, let's see. So we talked a little bit about Bill Gates. He's doing some good stuff. Do you remember a guy named Zell Kravinsky? And I told you not to worry about the details. So I'm just asking so that I'm not talking all the time. So don't really, really don't sweat it. So he, the author, Peter Singer, now I can reveal his name. Peter Singer basically says, okay, we can argue over whether Bill Gates is given enough money or not. Um, and maybe it's not fair to say that people have to give up all of the, you know, the bells and whistles that you can buy with extra money. But here's this guy, Zell Kravinsky, who he is actually putting his money where his mouth is or where his values are. He is basically, he gave most of his wealth away and is living a modest life, just enough to support his family. And I has, oh, sorry. What's that? I didn't remember, I remembered him, I just didn't remember his name. Oh, cool. So what, what else, do you remember anything else about him? Yeah, he donated his kidney and yeah. he said if there was his child and two other people, um, uh, like which life would he save? And he said two people because it's more than one or there's like a situation there. And then um, his wife also thought he was a little crazy. Everyone thought he was crazy, but he only wanted to help out other people. And yeah, he lives in like a very, very modest house now. So what do you think of that? What, like, is that what everybody should be doing? That just on its face, more lives. It's a number. Well, if everybody was doing that, that would be. Then nobody would need to years. donate. <laughs> True. So, so if everybody's not doing that, then does that change other people's responsibility? Well, everybody could do it a little, like halfway, like live a, like modest, not being like huge mansion but still not be like a shack, not be like just a house with a plain essentials. Be like have a, like a regular average house, but donate the rest of your money so everybody else can have a regular house. Yeah. With everything you don't need. What do you think of the idea that he, he's like, look, I love my kids. Actually, imagine what would, it, how would you feel if your dad said this? If your dad said what he said. Um, so, my kids, but, you know, for two other, um, so tough luck, Daisy and Eli. These are, or three, I have to say three, because there are two of you. Three other kids. What, like, what's your reaction to that? How dare you? <laughs> he would probably say if it was two, his, uh, like, two kids, and two people, he would probably say, say two kids. Yeah. He had to choose over two regular people, over two kids. <laughs> Who? Your kids. What's, what's right? Is, is Zell Kravinsky right that it's just a numbers game? Or should it matter that, you know, it's your own family involved? Uh, well, everyone is technically your family. Yeah. If my dad said that, I would probably like, I would probably say that's a reasonable opinion and I understand why you would do that, but I would say next time, can you not say in front of me and <laughs> find out? I, I, I'm down with that. Yeah, I just like don't hear it, right? That's just mm, funny. I love that. Um, so let's, you know, he, the, Peter Singer wraps up with the scenario. Um, do you remember it? This is what I asked you, kind of refresh your memory on, which is the scenario of people by a lake um, where there are children drowning in the lake. Do you remember it? Oh, yeah. There's 50 children drowning in the lake, and there's 50 parents who could easily go through, but they didn't want to get muddy because they were on a picnic. So if 25 people got, uh, went, in then they would feel like they did their job but there would still be 25 kids that died mm -hmm. so then uh 
the 25 people who did rescue might not go back to get another kid, but they're already muddy. But then they, one, they might blame it on the people who are muddy because they didn't get the other kid. And two, they might blame it on the people um, at the picnic because they didn't save a kid's life. Yeah. And I mean, who cares about getting muddy? <laughs> Seriously, in this scenario, like getting muddy is really like, come on, folks, let's, let's forget about our nice shoes. But what, <laughs> what do you think, um, what do you think you should do in that situation? He gives us the idea that, you know, well, Peter Singer says doing your fair share is not enough. If someone's not doing their part, you have to do more. Do you agree with that? I've yeah. done it a lot. I actually. have a personal experience, kind of like the drowning one. So I was, oh. jumping, <laughs> in a, I was jumping in a pool. When I was mm -hmm. like four. And I kept just jumping in a pool and I had water wings on. So I went down and then came up. And mm -hmm. I got out and then got back in. And five minutes later, after I, uh, no, not five minutes later, like right after I, I went, 30 seconds later, Daisy came over to my dad and said, Dad? Eli looks funny, and I had forgotten to put my water rings on, and I was just looking around at the bottom of, of my, the pool, and my dad leapt in there and grabbed me, and he forgot even to take his phone out. In the wall. Because he didn't care, right? What mattered in that moment was doing the right thing, which was to help you. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> wow, nuts. I actually, not that we should go down this rabbit hole of drowning pool stories, but I also had an experience at a, at a uh, birthday party when I was a kid where I couldn't swim and someone knocked me off my float and the mom of the host of the party ran in and, and got me, which I was also grateful for. And I was not, so I'm glad she was looking out for me so we could have this chat today. Um, okay, so I think we've, you know, belabored the, article enough i just want to pause a little bit like what questions are coming up for you if any before we jump into some, some debate and scenarios not much you and uh, nicole explained everything yeah i well. thought it was very interesting all of the scenarios and explanations and since my mom was reading it with me she had a lot of questions and she looked all of them up. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> and we had basically the same questions, so we got them covered. Nice. Oh my gosh. See, this is, I do value the collective. Um, actually, on that note, that is reminding me that I did want to say this article largely references philosophers who are um, part of Western philosophy. Is that, do you know what that means? Um, I kind of get what Western philosophy is. It's like, what a lot of people. Uh, philosophy, but I don't really know exactly what that is. I just know that people in the West. Have so when you, so that's actually the deal. So within Western philosophy, there are a lot of schools of thought, but what does the West mean? People, where is the West? I think it's that way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. In my opinion, I think it's that way. What I mean by why I'm calling this out is that Western philosophy largely only covers ideas of people who, um, you know, came from Europe or um, kind of descendants of Europe. So including the United States or even Australia, like Peter Singer. What it doesn't include are ideas from Eastern philosophy or African philosophy or other cultural traditions, which I think are very rich and very important. So what got me off on that kick was that uh, you said something about how we, uh, that triggered this idea in me about operating as a collective. And there are a lot of ideas in Eastern philosophy. I'm Indian. Um, and sometimes Eastern philosophy kind of um, is tied to religion in certain ways. So Hindu philosophy has a lot of ideas around how we're interconnected and effectively are one. You said something like that, Daisy, and I was like, oh, she, she could be an Eastern philosopher too. So, to what part of you mean by the West? Because technically, wherever you are, to the West of you is somewhere that we live. So you mean like the United States area? Or 
Yeah, in this context, it means all of the United States. So the West was referring to Europe and then through obviously colonization and various things and empire building, um, you know, the United States became the United States and, you know, we often have the same language, et cetera, but it's not the same as we often refer to Asia as the East. Um, and so generally ideas or philosophies that come broadly, very generally from these areas of the world are broken up like that. But obviously that doesn't even incorporate African philosophy and things like that too. I raise this because it's important to me that as you kind of build your own idea and understanding of the world, that you look for opportunities to engage diverse ideas and perspectives. Because some of these philosophical ideas from the West came at times where really bad things were happening to people who lived in the East, in Africa. Um, and so I think there's sometimes a missing perspective there. And I think for all of us, diverse ideas can lead to better ideas. Um, so that's my little box. Um, oh, go ahead. Did you have oh. Okay, so we're gonna take a little bit of a pivot to, to playing a little bit with some scenarios. I have a video that I want you to um, just take a look at. It's two minutes. Um, if during the video you need to kind of take a stretch break, um, you should feel free to do that. It's not that serious. Um, and I know we've been sitting for a little bit. So let me see if I can pull this off. I'm going to share my screen. And let me know as we go if you're seeing, um, if you're seeing the right stuff. Okay, what are you seeing now? Yeah. Fun or die exclusive. All right, here we go. You ready? Yep. Okay, tell me if I need to increase the sound. You can't really hear it very well. I don't, it's, you can't. Yeah. You can put subtitles on, that would probably help. How do I do this? Okay. What was that? What did you say? What was that? I didn't. Re I didn't get a lot of a lot of it. Can you just explain like the? Oh software? no! I'm so sorry. I'll send you a link afterwards so you can see it. But basically, I mean, it's just a funny way of representing just the, the moral conundrums. So basically, you see the one guy saying, "Okay, you have to choose whether you're going to push a button or not. If you push the button somewhere." somebody somewhere in the world that you don't know will die and the guy just pushes the button <laughs> um and then he just keeps kind of pushing the button and then the other person who's offering the you know the test says the deal was basically a million dollars or you push the button right it's supposed to be funny and if you didn't see it and didn't think it was funny don't worry about it i thought it was just a funny way to say there are some things that you know are just 
is there's a right answer. You know, I told you there are right and wrong answers, but like you kind of don't get to push a button and kill somebody elsewhere in the world just because you want a million dollars. Would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. You can't, you can't do that. So it was just a way of showing that he was so flip about it um, that is that is absurd, frankly. Um, but more seriously, there are decisions that we make that do impact the lives of others. As you know, there are ways in which government decisions impact the lives of others. So I want to give you both a chance to make some decisions. So I heard, I think, in one of these articles that you've gone to debate camp or that you like debate. Is that true? Debate camp. And okay. Like <laughs> so I'm going to give you a scenario and I want each of you and we'll assign sides differently. If you want to jot notes down about the scenario, you should feel free to do that. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you to argue a different position, a moral position. So, okay. So here's the scenario. You're standing on the side of a track when you see a runaway train hurtling towards you because the brakes have failed. Ahead are five people who are all tied to the track. If you do nothing, the five people will be run over by the train and killed. Luckily, you are next to a signal switch. If you turn that switch, it'll send the train down a side track just ahead of you, so you can turn the train. But on that side track, you see one more person tied to the track. Changing direction, if you push that button, will result in that person being killed. You don't have time to untie anyone. So what should you do? So I'll well, give you <laughs> yeah. So I am going to ask Daisy, I want you to argue the side of you should not push the button. You shouldn't do anything. And Eli, I'm going to ask you to argue the side of you have to push the button. Okay. okay. Give you a little bit of time to think about it. If you're ready, I mean, we can go for it, but I want to give you some. <laughs> you're ready? You're ready? than usual, but I'm kind of ready. Yeah. Wow, yeah. go for it. Who wants to start? I'll go first. Okay. So there's five people on one side and one person on the other side. One person's going to die if you press the button. Five people are going to die if you don't. Press the button. If you press the button, then you will be accused for committing a murder. And if you don't press the button, you will be a cute, uh, you will be a bystander watching someone get, mur five people get murdered. So they'll accuse you, so they might accuse you of being an accomplice in the murder of five people instead of being involved in the murder of one. Well, it would be the person who drove the train's fault, or technically the train's fault if the train went out haywire. So the train broke. So it's not the driver's fault. It would be your fault for not pressing a button. Hmm. And I'm pretty sure that a law official would want you to kill one person rather than by doing nothing, killing five. So you want to spend your time going to ask a law official instead of pressing the button now? Nope. <laughs> okay, I think that's a wrap. Uh. <laughs> That's awesome. I appreciate that so much. That was so good. Now, what did you, what do you really think? Do you, do you agree with the size that you took? You should press the button. I had a hard time thinking of ways to not press the button. Really? So what, um, so essentially you're saying, but Eli, your argument around um, inaction, being an action, very powerful. That's something that's hotly debated often. Um, and I wonder, would it matter to either of you if you knew either the one person on the track or, and I know I keep asking different versions of this question, but you know, you can see when it becomes harder and harder. Would it matter if you knew either the one person or somebody on the other side of the track? I was thinking. I, what would be, depend on who it would be. 
but probably I would, if, if it wasn't someone like I was really close to, then I would probably still push the button. Yeah. But if it was someone I'm really close to, then this is kind of a hack, and I know this is not really answering the question. Right as the train was going onto the track, I would switch the track, making it go onto the dirt. Wouldn't work, but who knows? <laughs> but then I don't know. Yeah, it's super complicated. And honestly, like, I just want to point something out. If you still kill the person you know, then you got five more people who are close to you. <laughs> you made more friends. <laughs> Um, look, this stuff is tough. It's really tough. Um, I talked to your parents a little bit about a show that I love called The Good Place. Um, they've seen it. I know you haven't. But there is an excerpt or a video uh, that kind of illustrates this problem, which is sometimes known as the trolley problem. And it's very funny. Um, if I find it, I'll send it to you so you can see that. And you can see that if you're making quick decisions. Yeah, I saw a preview of that. It said, due to a, a mistake, Eleanor shelf drop. Was that the mistake? I don't remember yeah. the rest of it, but that was it, the mistake. It, she, it, oh, interesting. That wasn't the mistake. Um, that is referring to kind of the entire premise of the show. But um, actually, here's a, here's a curiosity from the show, or frankly for life, that I would offer to you. Do you think that people um, are either all bad or all good, or if they're bad, they're always bad or that they have the opportunity to grow and become better? I would say, honestly, you can change. Anybody can change. You're never all bad and you're never all good. You're just in the middle. And if you are doing something that is completely and utterly bad and you're like enjoying it, oh, you're all bad, but you can still change. You don't start out all bad. You start out as an innocent baby. <laughs> who's done absolutely nothing who, who's not like I'm going to rule the world and destroy everything in my path and you can go back to being an innocent baby if you really try <laughs> yeah. um, still. I like that that might even kick in some ideas of Aristotle's virtue ethics that you can kind of practice um, becoming better uh, as a human and frankly I agree with that too uh, it's a lot of what guides my work uh, in schools and in public education. Um, we have been talking for a while. You tell me, I have one more question. We could take on something that you've discussed before and then you decide how we're gonna either solve immigration, <laughs> climate change, or COVID-19, or if you're kind of like, whew, this is, this is a lot, we, we can tag out and see where you've landed on your, on your rules to live by. How are you feeling? You want, how about we do the COVID-19? Because it's still the elephant in the room. Yeah, it is the elephant. Are, are you game for that, Casey? Are you tired? Uh, yeah, I'm game. Okay, let's do it. So let's, um, so just to start, like, let's think about what's, what's happening now versus what we want to be true. And that'll be kind of the problem we're trying to solve for. So what's happening now is there's a global pandemic. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people are getting sick. A lot of people are losing their jobs. And a lot of people are and can't get And some food. people are getting better. Positive note there. And what we want to happen is people are donating a lot more than they would because they're like, we need to help. We need to do something. And they're helping more. But you could have helped before the global pandemic to help prevent the global pandemic so, so. Okay, so what do you think first in the way that the, let's say, in the way that the government is responding, um, do you think we're operating with the idea that all lives have equal value? Let's go back to that big, big first question we talked about. Well, I think that no, we're not. Well, actually, kind of. It depends on how you think about it. Because, like, we're saving people who are re doing really, like, badly and they're going to die. And that's caring about all lives. But some people, we're just sending away because they can't care about them. It depends on how you think about it. Because we're like, we don't have enough hospital beds or ventilators to take care of you. And you're probably going to be fine. So they let you just go home. And you probably won't die. But it's still possible. 
and they're saving the people who are actually really in trouble. So it really depends on how you think about it. Oh my gosh, they're turning people down who have COVID-19 and they could spread it. Yes, but they're also protecting people who will die soon die from COVID-19 and they're turning down the people who have a mild case. Mm -hmm. It just all depends on the way you think about it. Absolutely. What? Um, oh yeah, go ahead, Daisy. Uh, I think I agree with you. What are um, what are you doing? So, what should we do as individuals? What are we being asked to do? Um, and what do you think we should be doing to get us help where you can? What's that? Donate where you can, and just do what you can. Like, if you have a mask and you're going on a walk, and you know that there's going to be like and you're like going on a walk on a popular street, wear a mask. Don't stay and talk to your friends in the middle of a global pandemic on a walk. Keep walking, say hi, sorry, we're, it's, there's a global pandemic, we can't get close, see you when the quarantine's over, or just <laughs> a Zoom call with them, but that's helping. Like, you could have COVID-19 and you could not know, or they could have COVID-19 and you not know, and if you just keep doing that and saying hi to people and walking up to your friends, one of your friends, uh, give, gave you COVID-19 and now you're giving all those friends COVID-19, the other friends you meet. You should social distance, donate where you can, and help where you can. Like I just said. What do you Daisy? think, Stacey? I saw you nodding, but what, what, like, what would I donate to? How can, it's so big. So many things, so many lives being lost. There's so A many. Of, like craft centers have extra gloves. It would be helpful to donate them. Or if you have a sheet of plastic you can cut out like face like shields and if you have extra masks then you can donate them and if you have like a paint suit a sturdy paint suit well you can wash it and then you can donate it just so people like can that. use it to like knit the face masks or they can work it but shouldn't, but shouldn't if someone says like the government should be doing that, not me. I'm just an individual citizen. Um, this is something that is too big for me to do. I feel like the government should be making sure that everybody has the safety equipment that they need. Well, if you do it, and then I'm sure then, well, other people are doing it. So if you do it, you're just gonna add on to the people. And if everybody like, thinks that nobody's gonna do a thing well if you have like one thing and then you add on to it it's a bigger thing and then you're really not alone anymore and it's not too big for you because other people are helping out mm -hmm. but not only for the government to deal with well if you think it is then try out helping someday and you'll <laughs> <laughs> you're wrong <laughs> yeah. you're thinking that including the government the citizens should be helping why? Absolutely nothing's going to do anything. Why? No, I'm not, the citizens citizen should be helping, but the government should do. Yeah. Everyone should be helping if they can. Like, if you what? can, if you like, absolutely nothing, and, like, you're struggling to get by, and you, like, and people are like, donate $50, and you're like, that's going to be my dinner for a week. I can't donate $50, otherwise I won't have dinner. Don't donate $50, but help when you can. Yeah. Now, in your conversation about COVID-19, you also talked about how a lot of people were out of work. What is, and what is the government's responsibility or our responsibility as individuals to help people who are... Help out, really. Um, I guess if you have like extra granola bars, you can send them to people. If you have if you got well, a giant sure gift card to the store that uh, to that to the store that just shut down, you can donate the money to them to help them stay alive. Go to shut down. Yeah. Oh, go yeah. to shut down. Well, yeah. Um, I know I have an extra gift card to place this. Which is nice. And there's uh, now a lot of conversation or debate in the um, government about should should the government be sending people money every month to help them get by there were some examples of this before that one and one of the cares act and now it's up for discussion again what do you think i think the government um like they should spend money on help on stopping over 19 because if nobody does anything it's not gonna stop 
for years. It's just going to keep going, and we're going to be in quarantine for years, and the economy will uh, get shut down. We need to do something to stop it, because if this happens for too long, the entire global economy could collapse. Mm -hmm. Nobody's working. No money is going around. People can't have jobs. They can't earn money. And you can't live on what you earned from last month for years. That's right. And you can't work. Because if we don't do anything, it'll just get worse and worse. Right. And Daisy, what do you think billionaires should be? Um, I think they should be, like, handing out an extra car, I guess. Um, <laughs> they have the capability, so it's good for them to put it. Put it to use. And some of them, Bill Gates included, um, there is somebody who uh, I'm affiliated with, uh, Eli Broad, who is contributing to scientific research to try to support the fast kind of um, our ability to test and our ability to find a vaccine. And many other people in the world are doing that too. Um, so I will I leave you with that. Um, I would love your just final thoughts. Um, and I'll share with you that I, I think I said this at the beginning of our chat, I heard you say in your final thoughts on climate change, I think Eli, you said, um, we need to do something that we can't just pass it down to other generations because everybody has to deal with it. And Daisy, you said something that I also appreciate, which was maybe we can do more than those who are affected. Essentially saying that there are some people who are more effective and more vulnerable than some of us and we can do more. I thought those were brilliant ideas. Do you have any, and you maybe not even, you didn't even know you were being philosophical in those statements. Do you have any new ideas or rules to live by that I can take with me and anyone else who's watching? Well, I've just, always help when you can if you can do something to help as long as it doesn't hurt you do it like keep an eye out for yourself if everybody is sacrificing everything for a single cause and they like leave themselves with nothing there's not going to be anybody left you have to uh give enough but uh give enough to help not like a dollar done no more donations give enough to help but only uh, give enough, only give when you can give. Um, I never really like saying be kind. I always just like saying be as kind as you can because people know their limits and when it's enough for them, then it's enough for them. So that's always a little I try to live by, I guess. I like that. So give when you can, be as kind as you can. Um, and if you can do a little more, do it. Yeah. yeah, do it. Maybe your limit is not where you think it is, right? which is some of what I heard you say throughout our conversation. I have loved talking to you. I hope you had some fun thinking about these big things that adults are often thinking about people in elected office. Maybe it'll inform who you vote for when you get a chance to vote. Maybe it'll inform what service projects you take on. Um, a maybe fun postscript project that you could take on is if you took one of these, and by the way, you don't have to do any of this, but it's just a thought. If there's an issue that you care about and you want people to behave and or act in a way, whether that's the government, other billionaires, or your friends, um, act in a way that you believe is moral, how could you leverage some of what you learned in the social psychology class uh, you took to influence others towards better behavior? How would you make a campaign? A campaign? So, again, totally optional. I'm not grading anything, <laughs> um, but think about it. I just close up by saying um, this is Teacher Appreciation Week. I am giving a shout out to all the teachers who are doing amazing work for those who influenced my life. I'm not a real teacher, I just play one on Zoom and apparently YouTube, um, but I have so much love and respect for those who instilled in me the learning that I have and that I can clearly see both of you. Yeah, we thank you too. Thanks, teachers. Thanks, teachers. Bye. Bye.
All right. With that, I'll say bye. It was great chatting with you, Jay-Z and Eli. I hope we get to meet again. Bye. Bye. Bye.